I'm going to really now ask um, the second panelists to come in because we are going to look at the more grassroots responses in the context of secular and communal divides. Uh, we will also look at the minority questions and those emerging in the, um, the borderlands, um, again, with reference to China, as well as uh, the whole question of contentious federalism uh, remains quite strong, even in this particular session that we're going to um, look at. So um, all in all, I would say that let's start off now with uh, Shanawaz Ali Rehan, who is a PhD scholar at St. Anthony's um, Oxford University. And he has also worked in the editorials of uh, Eishomoy, the Bengali edition of the Times of India, as well as Column. And he's the author of several uh, Bengali books on politics. So if you'd like to start off, Shanawaz, that'd be great. Thanks. Got to unmute. I'm audible now. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjit Pradeep. Thank you for inviting me to speak and to share the platform. You can increase your volume slightly, I think. Hello. Am I audible? Yes. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> so it's a great pleasure for me to um, share the platform with uh, dignitaries like uh, famous scholars uh, ranging from fields ranging from history to politics to economics and wonderful uh, audiences also. So <clears throat> in this election, actually what I am uh, mostly uh, looking into, I'm interested is uh, uh, the, the, the Hindu vote actually, the only vote bank uh, in Bengal. So we, uh, let's just start with rippling the uh, misconception that there is a Muslim vote bank. If uh, uh, there is no Muslim vote bank right now in Bengal because Muslims are voting TMC, Congress, ISF, whatever. But if there is any chunk of uh, uh, any, any vote bank uh, re which really exists right now in Bengal, it's either the Hindu Swar vote bank this is the BJP, which won 18 seats last election, last uh, Lok Sabha election, or the anti-BJP Hindu secular vote bank, which we are looking, uh, we are uh, we are expecting them uh, from whom we are expecting that that they will defeat the BJP. And uh, uh, I'm mostly interested in uh, this both kind of vote banks, the secular vote bank and the and the secular Hindu vote bank and the and the Hindu Hindu to vote bank. And what I have found that uh, this anti BJP uh, secular parties, they all fail to address the elephant in the room. And that is what is the true character of BJP. So how did the social and intellectual context out of which lib uh, the Bengal liberalism or the Bengal modernity sprang in 19th century Bengal is also responsible for the rise of uh, Hindutva uh, in, uh, in North India during the 20th century. So these are the questions we need to introspect right now. How the Bengali left and the Congress leaders were drawn to it even after the partisan what role, what role this religio or political traditions play in the formation of CPIMS socialist consciousness or Congress or TNCs, this recent Bengali nationalism. So these are the questions I, 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 was, uh, I was wondering from last couple of weeks. And it reminded me once my supervisor uh, was, uh, was referring his chat with Deepesh Chakraborty. In which Deepesh told to him that secularism does not, in fact, have deep conceptual history in India. Same can be said about Bengal. It is not an important category in the early nationalist movement that, and was only used by the Congress as a way to degenerate the Muslim League as a communal. That is secular, uh, uh, a communal. Why it only exists in the English usage and why it only made into the constitution with Indira Gandhi 
is just because that we had a lot of riots later and we thought that now we need secularism. So look, uh, in Bengal also, this is the crisis of liberalism. This is the crisis of our notion about secularism or culture, a hegemonic culture, which is the Bangalit, which is very much urban and which is very much elite, which is very much upper caste Hindu. So look how easily Didi or those left cadres, who, those who are not pleased with their party's decision to include ISF, Abbas, Siddiqui, in Songjukto Morcha, how easily can they brand Abbas Siddiqui as a communal? Look, I don't have much hope about uh, Abbas Siddiqui or meme in Bengal because Abbas Siddiqui is it's like it's like uh, more Catholic than the Pope. Abbas Siddiqui is right now trying to project himself as a more uh, communist than Surjo Kanto Misro. That's and uh, by doing that, he sometimes forgets to attack BJP for. NRC, CA, Ram Mandir. I, I never hear that any politician is referring Ram Mandir in this, in this election. And Didi is very consciously avoiding this kind of terms. So, 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 so what I was saying that, uh, and uh, so Abbas Siddiqui or like uh, meme, these are, these are identity politics. You may like it or you may not like. But the way, the way uh, Mamuta Banerjee or like uh, those uh, uh, CPM cadres dissatisfied with their party's decision to in invite Abbas in the brigade, how easily they can, they can equate Abbas with Dilip Ghosh. So is it possible for a minority living in a, in a country, uh, in, a, in a country ruled by Hindu to a, a brigade and is it, is it possible that a minority can be in the same footing with a, with a, with its with his oppressor? You can you can so so why we are not using the same term for other identity politics, uh, either leaders of identity politics like Mayabhati? Three times he made alliance with BJP, but the Muslim politics, the Muslim the, the, the identity politics and Muslims are dissatisfied with the secular parties when they are trying to form a political party. You are equally you are easily equating them with BJP. So, and 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 another thing is uh, another thing is that the Bengali uh, 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 the Bengali uh, middle class they are actually they are actually. Uh, they, 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 the way they are taking Abbas Siddiqui or like me, something as an outsider, I'm talking about those who want to defeat BJP. They are, they, they, they want them in the, in the, in the alliance so that they can, they can uh, have some Muslim vote or uh, CPM can extend its, its base among the Muslims but still the portrayal of Abbas, still the portrayal of meme supporters is outsiders. So here, here comes the thing. So how many outsiders we have got? We, uh, outsider means uh, uh, one whose, whose uh, accent is not false. So, so this, when, when, when we are offended, when Poilas Bijoyborgi is saying that Chira uh, I can I can I can easily identify a, 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 a person Bengali by his attire, or like uh, uh, he is uh, uh, he is uh, uh, making some remark uh, 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 derogatory remarks for the food habit of Bengalis. So you are only offended when it comes to this bhadrola kind of uh, cultural thing, but. Uh, so uh, 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 another point, what I wanted to say that uh, I think what Deepesh said to my supervisor during that chat can be said about this, uh, this liberalism, what we are witnessing right now among the Bengali Bhadrologs, those who want to defeat the BJP. No matter B BJP, uh, 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 my another point is no matter BJP win or lose this election, many Bengali Hindu religious reformers, novelists, or periodical editors vision of Hindu life has actually already came full circle in Bengal with some changes. And, the, and our, 
our uh, the uh, not uh, i mean the 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 secular parties or the or the bengali bhadralok's problem is with these changes that occurred in last 125 years while this ideology was roaming all over all over india the modern the hindu bhadralok problem is more with this change actually and bonkim's hindutva which formed the first nucleus of 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 the of hindutva politics in bengal this uh, this guy is, is still our sahitya samrat if we don't make mention write his name without mentioning sahitya samrat one mark will be deducted so this this kind of the whatever bjp is doing right now whatever happening in bollywood bollywood is the uh, more powerful history teacher in in india than in jnu history professor so whatever they are doing with the distortion of history or whatever this has actually this ha everything has already happened in bengal 125 years or 150 years back so the question is is tmc is shongjukto morcha capable enough to defeat uh, this uh, this force is bhadralaks are capable enough i think they might they may they may defeat but but this is not due to uh, uh, this is due to the weakness of this may happen due to the weakness of of bjp mostly they fail to they fail to project the uh, chief ministerial candidate the notion of hindu divinity is much different in bengal than northern india it may happen for this region it may happen that mamata's claim to represent the true bengo bengali hindus has actually getting momentum in different part of bengal his visit of uh, different temples has been liked by uh, several voters the farmers protest or the gas price hiking can be the factor the bjp uh, the the accepting of corrupted tmc leaders into the into bjp actually infuriated uh, infuriated lot of bjp supporters so it may happen for this booth capturing rigging or like konnasri or for example uh, uh, shastra sati but it, it, it but bjp will not defeat just because this is a communal party and that's the crisis without liberalism and one more thing i the last thing i want to uh, i want to highlight that 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 the the term the sub the subaltern hindu tour which uh, one of the sajjan kumar uh, he's a, he, he's uh, from last couple of months he's writing in every newspaper he's attacking all the political parties except bjp so he is saying that look it's not the bhotro logs right now they are very tiny or they are very they are very calcutta centric it's the it's the the subalterns the lower caste the dalits they are actually right now with bjp they voted for bjp in 2019 so that's why there is a uh, hope that bjp for hope for bjp that they will they will uh, come in power i have slightly rephrased it as a mafusal hindutva because not just the laborers or the or the farmers are joining bjp the the uh, 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 mafusal elites are also joining so the thing is uh, one thing is clear that uh, 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 the subaltern uh, the, the 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 mafusal hindutva is not getting momentum right now because of these reasons which i have recently mentioned price hike gas farmers protest bjp's failure to to project someone as a cm candidate mamata banerjee's the way he is right now the true inheritor of uh, the true inheritor of of the 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 left uh, party society or this uh, the relationships so for maybe for these reasons bjp uh, the subaltern hindutva will be will get defeated but we can't say that this is the this is uh, this is the triumph of liberal values or secularism this is just maybe due to the vote management or some kind of anti incumbency of modi rule thank you okay we we really have to wrap this because um you know we we're, we're really running <laughs> you know time time has to be kept slightly and thank you chadavas for giving us this glimpse into um subaltern hindutva and why some things would work and why why the change is also happening i think 
that ties up greatly with lots of questions on caste and uh, why caste is also important in politics. I don't know whether uh, these things can be tied up with uh, all the regions that, that you've brought out. But I think we, we really need to think about communal polarization and versus community appeasement. And that is something that um, we'll have from our next speaker, Bengal between communal polarization and community appeasement by Ipsita Haldar, who's an associate professor at Comparative Ajadavpur University, Comparative Literature. And she was also the Charles Wallace Fellow in South Asia Institute. So welcome to the forum, Ipsita. Uh, Ipsita's essays on community identity, uh, visual and sonic piety and issues of citizenship of the Shia Muslims of Bengal uh, through the readings of Muharram have been published uh, in different journals and anthologies as well. And she's also, there's a monograph that is forthcoming on the polemic of identity formation, religiosity and literary modernity of the Bengal Muslims in the wake of Bengali nationalism from Rutledge. So over to you, Ifshita, if you would like to keep to uh, you know, a few points and, and keep it short as well. Thank you. Thank you, um, Professor Sanjukta Ghosh, for inviting me um, to be a part of this prestigious panel. I'm sharing this virtual platform with the eminent experts, but not as a political analyst. I'm here as a common voter with my basic reflections as a teacher of the humanities. Some of my observations will resonate to be the nodal points of Shainavaz, the previous speaker, and many issues are already brilliantly posited by the scholars in the previous session. No matter who wins on May 2, a Bengal elections 2021 will be remembered for a big loss, the unprecedented communal polarization and hate speeches. Hatred towards the religious minority has already become a driving force among the majority of the masses and the eruption of violence did not remain a state of exception anymore. Rather, physical and psychological violence towards the Muslims has become rampant, regular, and everyday, articulated in open head speech, life threats, and lynching. It has become normalized and, I must say, banal. COVID-19 provided another occasion for vilification. The mainstream media offered the confused masses their real enemy, Tablighi Jamaat as a super spreader of the virus. It was the unprecedented irresponsibility of the media to sensitize the majority masses against certain people by calling them corona bombs by designating and designating the Nizamuddin, I mean, congregation as conspiracy against India. So the pandemic became communalized. And just before the corona outbreak, we have seen how the students of Jamia Millia Islamia, activists, and the community people participating in the anti-CAA NRC movement were indiscriminately arrested and tortured, and how the Muslim agitators were declared the rioters and imprisoned. It was the double gateweization of the movement, we should admit. When the assembly polls started in Bengal, communalization and polarization of Bengal was the most ready tool to handle the most democratic political process to form a democratic enterprise. The strongest part of politics, this, I'm sorry, the strangest part of politics in our country is its sudden responsiveness. Rather than a scrutiny of the government's model of development, tangible economic or intangible cultural growth, human rights and justice, redress of grievances, we crave for drama, glamour, and instant gratification. Hate speech today has all three elements. And it is to be remembered that it is not only towards the religious minority. Hate speech of some of the nodal politicians are now being directed towards women, Dalits, and ethnic minorities, crossing all ethical barriers. And when confronted, they are completely unapologetic for such indecent remarks. And those politicians are simply justifying their lumpen vocabulary and styles of speaking as being what and how the masses speak. Thus, they are claiming to be breaking any elitism that takes the masses away from social resources and opportunities. I have two issues to mark here. Firstly, who are the masses in Bengal now, according to this discourse, and how their culture, socialization, language are being uh, uh, appropriated and in interpreted here? If these politicians speak in the language of the masses, how could such anti lower caste, anti-ethnicity remarks saturate their speech? Secondly, 
uh, Bengal BJP and its tech mascot wisely did not target uh, the Bengali Bhadrulo. But we have just learned from Shainaz that it's actually a kind of overlap territory. You can't really separate uh, the domain of Lumpenization, uh, you know, from the Bengali Bhadrulo, uh, you know, formulation of, uh, of politics and political language. And social media can be a very important archive to understand that that uh, shared kind of uh, you know exchange. Uh, BJP targeted grassroots for polarization. Firstly, it appealed to rural youths and Dalits and Adivasis by saying they were deprived in the previous political regimes and gave them the promise of muscular masculine strength and mainstream identity. Both considering their position vis-a-vis -vis the caste-based Hindu society were empowering to this huge section. BJP's polarization can be said to be bottom-up and make Hindu fundamentalism aspirational for semi-urban and rural youths, Dalits and Adivasis. In a state where the founder of the party, Shama Prashad Mukherjee was born, BJP was so far sort of non-existent. But from, a, from, from 18 parliamentary seats in 2019, about which Professor uh, Ghatok has uh, uh, elaborated, uh, you know, properly. So uh, 18, from this uh, 18 parliamentary seats in 20, 2019, the way BJP has made deep inroads to the nooks and corners of Bengal only proves that communal feelings were not absent. They were only dormant and not channelized properly since the time of the Bengal partition in 1947, since the time of left front, which laid the state politics for a stretch of a very important 34 years. This Bengal election seems to be very important for BJP to win as it means a historical shift and a long-term impact on the communal life of the people. The groundwork for polarization was done before 2019 Lok Sabha elections. The central government published citizenship matrix that triggered the Hindu majority of Bengal to think that they were going to be outnumbered by the Muslims with their many wives. And on the other side, Mamata Banerjee's gestures, like her giving stipends to imams and her suspending, uh, say, Durga Puja immersions on the day of Ashura, the 10th of Moharram in 1917, were represented as minority appeasement. Such steps of the chief minister failed to create community harmony and could not show possible models of empowerment from below for the Muslim community in general. About this, many interesting uh, you know, discussion uh, have already been made in the previous session. In Bengal, in Bengal a non-negotiable vacuum was created. The left front, after its defeat in the election, went into hibernation and did not show its youth cadres the possible political ways to consolidate into a constructive oppositional force. Youths caught in the vacuum created by the left front and the lack of clear cut strategy by TMC joined the BJP in large numbers attracted by, to repeat, hyper masculine Hindutva. Srinomul, after, even after sensing this shift, however, disappointingly did not counter the communal polarization with continuous progressive development policies. Rather, it relied on doles, instant gratifications that bypass the question of capacity building. So the beneficiary does not get skilled, but does not get skills, but a feeling of entitlement. So the promises of bigger doles can change one's political orientation overnight. Exactly what's happening right now. When I talk with my friends who uh, say teach at the girls, rural girls madrasas, they say, why doesn't Didi instead ask what we or these girls actually need? But here, I, I am quoting them, we need to mention that the cycle in the Konrashi project actually brought paradigmatic shift in female education in the state. And many um, mad my, my uh, madrasa teacher friends know that even if Trinomul Dole is superficial and top down, just to ensure the loyalty of the community, Trinomul stands as the most viable anti-fundamentalist force in this election. Left Front, sadly, could not play the part of a constructive position in these 10 years, as if, and I quote uh, a kind of very committed Left Front worker here, that as if defeat and resurrection does not happen in any political party's history. These committed left voters express their disappointment in the private and also in public as well. Left Front could not attract rural and suburban youths in large numbers, nor stop the defection of its general cadres to the right wing. 
during elections, its abrupt alliance with Congress, which with which it is it has a very troubled past and inbuilt rifts, might not be very convincing to many. This assembly election, again, seems to be a turning point for left front as well, with its newly awakened capable youth brigade as the critique of uh, religious fundamentalism. That is a sign of promise. That might be a sign of promise. But the main question is, why Bengal could get polarized to this extent? Is it that Mamata's dole to the neighborhood, cl neighborhood clubs stirred up emotions at every ritual occasion, which made the community more self-conscious as a Hindu community? Is it the culture of politicians with fickle ideologies defecting to other parties? Or is it the left front's focus on class as the key element to understand injustice without addressing the deep-rooted caste and religious biases in the society? even while carrying the legacy of the 1947 Bengal partition? Or is it the religious consciousness now out of puja rooms into streets, the majority Hindu, Hindus grew more conscious of the facilities they received from the state and what the minorities received? That Trinomul Tan BJP candidate could reorient the voters of Nundigram community uh, communally in three, four months flat can be taken as a very uh, important symptom here. It is clear that religious multiplicity was never addressed as the strength of a community, and it never reflected in the education policy of the state. There was or is no grassroots level training of the teachers to address the unique pluralistic history of our community through classroom teaching. Unity in diversity remained a statement on, on, on culture without if ever addressing religious moorings of the people in the secular context that the constitution of India conceptualized differently from the European understanding of secularism. Under left rule, an all engrossing class struggle overshadowed and consumed all kinds of social difference and multiplicity. Momota celebrated religious events without her government educating people on the responsibility of cohabiting with differences with the responsibility of cohabiting with minority with their, uh, with their different sets of attributes. In this context, left front's alliance with Furfura Sharif's Abba Siddiqui looks like attracting the Muslim voters are cutting up Mamata's treasure trove, of course. Now, how to read this alliance? Is there any pending homework on the intersectional connection between class and religion as a groundwork for this alliance? Is there any? Have the left front members reoriented themselves to understand the social relevance of a religious outfit? Right now, it is quite evident that Bengal's legacy of a culturally progressive civil society, not only in Kolkata, but also in the districts, which was vibrant and strong for generations, has suffered massively. If you look at the exchange in social media, the intellectual emptiness and hate is much visible. It is also clear that it's not only the IT or IT cells or pro-establishment media that are responsible for communal polarization. The middle class, Bhadraluk, are already polarized, supporting and perpetuating hatred with a new logic that is also unprecedented. Violence towards the minority other has become an integral element of political consciousness, a part of open public rhetoric. And I would like to end here by quoting a new convert friend of mine who said, I quote, we need a non-Brahmin chief minister now. There should be a ghosh after the Vatacharyas and Banerjee's quote ends. And I end here by saying the mimicry of a caste critic sounds extremely annoying to many. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shantika. Thank you so much, Ipshita. I think there are some questions that uh, you might like to address later uh, if we have the time. But I want to move to um, contentious federations and battle for Bengal from uh, Ambur Ghosh. Ambur, are you ready for uh, this moment? I think that you've been waiting so patiently to talk on the battle for Bengal. Um, and I just want to uh, also tell everyone that uh, Ambur Ghosh is uh, based in Jadavpur University and he's a researcher on political reform at the Observer Research Foundation, Kolkata. And he's also recently co-authored a monograph on Bengal elections, a very timely titled Battle for Bengal 2021, 
political themes and electoral dynamics. Over to you, Amber. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh. Mm, I'm, I'm audible, I hope. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, you know, it's indeed a, a great, a, a great opportunity to be a part of this very, very eminent and interesting panel. Indeed, a very captivating and nuanced discussion. I, I, I personally learned a, a lot from it. Uh, so basically, the the, the monograph uh, that I have recently co-authored with my colleague uh, Somia at Warif, uh, you know, it, it looks at the electoral data to highlight the the meteoric political consolidation of the BJP over time in the last few years in the state you know, and how it has emerged as, as a major political force uh, challenging the incumbent ruling party. Uh, you know, since this, the, 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 the story of BJP's, uh, you know, you know uh, consolidation has already been, uh, you know, taken up uh, adequately by um, Professor Ghotok and also uh, Dr. Roy. Uh, so definitely I will not, uh, you know, you know, delve uh, much into it. So. Uh, I'll directly go into my, uh, you know, main uh, main uh, point that I intend to make uh, today on uh, on contentious, you know, federalism, and how the narrative of, you know, uh, such, uh, you know, such such contentious uh, notion of federalism and federal politics is kind of being manifested in the context of Bengal elections. Uh, that has something, you know, directly, you know, you know, directly linked to uh, to to the to the to the overarching theme of, of, of Bengal elections, the, one of the most dominant themes of, of Bengal election, which is the rise of the BJP. BJP. Since BJP is now, uh, you know, is the, is the almost the, the politically hegemonic force at the national level uh, in India, and also in part in many states. Hence, uh, the, the discussion on, 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 on federalism and what is, you know, what is, what is the nature of federalism or the fate of federalism that uh, you know, India is going to look at uh, in the run-up to this election, and, and, and definitely, you know, depends a lot on the outcome of the of the election. Uh, to be very fair, historically speaking, Bengal has a legacy of political dissent, uh, and the state government, uh, you know, has uh, largely defined its, its 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 politics in opposition to the centre, to the union government. Uh, of course, uh, you know, barring the the first two decades. You know where uh, the Congress ruled both the center and the state uh, after independence, but then since then we have, we have seen how the the, the left front uh, rule and then you know followed by the TMC have you know defined their uh, politics uh, in opposition to uh, you know uh, the center, which is a narrative of safeguarding the region or you know Bengal's uh, specific interests against the high-handedness, insensitivity, and discrimination of the center. You know who is largely uh, you know perceived uh, to be alien to the state's uh, needs as well as uh, region's culture. Uh, now coming uh, to the to the contemporary uh, scenario, uh, contentious federalism has been you know uh, the one of the you know major I mean the the, the modus operandi uh, of the interactions between the BJP led center, you know, as BJP eventually rose to become the most dominant political force, and and of course the states you know which are ruled by the opposition parties. Uh, but you know, in in this entire narrative of of you know uh, uh, combative or contentious federalism, West Bengal stands out as something you know very unique uh, case, which is primarily because uh, the state the state government uh, led by Mamata Banerjee had emerged as one of the most vocal you know uh, uh, critics, apparently one of the most vocal critics of the BJP led you know, central government and its policies, both on the institutional level as well as you know the the political front. You know, Banerjee's perpetual uh, political tussle with the center over a host of uh, policy issues, which, which ranges from the GST compensation, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, arm fund management, uh, the, 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 the funding issue, uh, the CA and RC implementation, very vital, uh, the farm legislations, the, the contentious farm legislations recently passed, uh, the, the implementation of the central schemes, and of course, the foreign policy issues uh, for example, uh, TISA water sharing with Bangladesh. Now, now these uh, this narrative of, of constant you know content, uh, contention over over uh, a vast range of policies has been simultaneous with BJP's rise in Bengal. Uh, and of course, apart from the policy level uh, differences, the, the the kind of institutional intimidation that uh, you know that uh, the BJP is accused of against the the, the opposition parties. That has also been very, uh, you know, very, very, very uh, vehemently 
kind of uh, you know resented uh, critic by the by 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 uh, Mamata Banerjee. So so this has created you know uh, the the uniqueness of Bengal in terms of uh, India's evolving federal dynamics. It's constant uh, you know concerned as there is a constant uh, you know opposition. Uh, unlike many other uh, states ruled by regional parties. For example, uh, Orissa by, by Navin Patnaik or, or you know Delhi by Arvind Kejriwal, where the opposition has been very you know selective in nature. Uh, you know there, there are also many instances in which these these other regional parties, uh, strong in their own respective states, but also have been uh, quite accommodative. Uh, you know in terms of uh, uh, you know in terms of uh, accepting BJP or you know supporting BJP in many of its uh, major policy divisions. Uh, so, but 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 Trinamool Congress under um, uh, you know Mamata Banerjee uh, becomes uh, an exception uh, with its you know constant uh, you know uh, ki kind of an antagonistic stand where, that it that it has been take, taking uh, against the center. Uh, one can argue that TMC's uh, you know uh, emergence has been more of a of a symbolic or a performative you know figure of opposition against the BJP, but 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 nevertheless uh, you know a very a very formidable. Uh, kind of a uh, kind of a, uh, a constant resentment that has you know marked the federal terrain. So now now coming to the elections, uh, how BJP is 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 using uh, the narrative, the political narrative of federal governance, you know, and and national security uh, to kind of uh, to kind to kind of uh, challenge uh, the TMC's dominance in the state. What what is what is BJP's argument all about, which which, which has a very strong. Uh, you know, bearing on the on the on the on the narrative of, of federalism in, in India, BJP's narrative is is, is basically that uh, since Fed, you know since you know West Bengal is a is a, is a bordering state, you know where where uh, the entire narrative of uh, uh, you know uh, in, 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 infiltration of the immigrants, especially uh, Bangladeshi Muslims, the around uh, you know premised on which the entire CA and RC debate has been you know. Uh, kind of politicized and you know aggravated by the BJP in the state. Also, the also the issue of uh, trafficking, uh, cattle trafficking, to be more precise, uh, CA and RC. All of, all of this has been you know being be, being being articulated by the BJP as a, as, as issues of national security, and the the narrative which is being constantly pushed is that BJP as as a, as as a party which is you know in power at the center has. The wherewithal to uh, you know to to take care of these uh, national security issues can secure the border border well, uh, and 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 it's fighting the and fight fighting the ruling TMC, which it is you know increasingly projecting as 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 an irritant or a, or a, or a stumbling block or hindrance in this entire process of uh, you know uh, process of uh, systematizing or 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 disciplining uh, the border or or you know taking care of the entire national security the dynamics. Uh, Despite the fact that you know uh, India has you know seen a very lingering uh, you know skirmish border skirmish with China, uh, China doesn't come in a, in a in a very real sense in the in the you know uh, Chinese threat doesn't come in a very real sense uh, in in BJP's nationalistic rhetoric uh, in 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 the Bengal elections. Of course, uh, you know needless to say that uh, though though the, though the center has uh, you know uh, some uh, basic structural constitutional high handedness uh, you know uh, powers. To you know, to to control the all the foreign policy divisions as well as issues of national security. But on the practical ground, since the center needs to always negotiate and have uh, the you know the the state government concerned on board, you know, as we have seen in case of uh, Tisa Water Treaty with Bangladesh, where Mamata Banerjee uh, couldn't be you know uh, convinced. So definitely, a similar kind of political dispensation at the at the state definitely eases out. You know uh, the, the the kind of hindrances that comes in the way of the center to pursue many of its uh, foreign policy uh, projects, uh, many of which can be can be uh, you know contentious in nature. Uh, that is true, but 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 how this narrative of of you know uh, double engine government, which is being uh, projected by by the BJP, in order to push uh, the idea that. Uh, Similar kind of uh, government, uh, you know, if, if there's a BJP government at the state level, then all kinds of uh, you know funds, centers funds, as as well as uh, you, you know central schemes can be very uh, in, in a very ha in a hassle-free manner can be uh, you know uh, can 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 be can be distributed to the uh, uh, people of Bengal, uh, and also the national security uh, you know uh, questions can also be taken care of. 
so so this is this is the narrative of 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 the of the double engine uh, uh, you know you know you know government that the bjp is talking about very interestingly this this is a marked departure from from the conventional narrative that bengal has always seen which which defines the bengal's exceptional exceptionalism in the sense that a regional party in bengal you know is 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 has has been touted as you know to be to be to be to be most uh, well equipped you know to to safeguard the region's you know specific idiosyncratic interests against the center which is very alien you know you know what, what happened uh, you know throughout the, the 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 left rule and then then the tmc rule that uh, you know the, the the regional party is seen as a vanguard of of the region's culture as well as the region's interest uh, who who is you know well equipped to check the center's high handedness or the center's you know overwhelming dominance uh, arbitrariness uh, which might jeopardize the state's interest this entire narrative you know was turned on its head by the bjp by saying that this these regional forces these specific regional uh, you know uh, uh, political parties uh you, you know ha have been you know has been the primary reason uh, why uh, you know uh, you know so called development uh, you know could not be consolidated in bengal and hence uh, similar you, you know uh, government a kind of political homogeneity is required at both the level center as well as the state uh, which is a bjp government at the state level which can kind of you know uh, facilitate a kind of unmediated uh, you know flow of uh, so called flow of development uh in the state you know uh you, you know uh, where 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 uh, the, the the irritant of regional parties uh can be can be cleared out who are you know touted as ineffective corrupt so on and so forth so so this is the kind of you know uh, uh, double engine uh, government's argument that that, that that the center is you know that the bjp is trying to pose it uh you know has has a very important bearing on how we are going to perceive uh you know federalism or or federal uh, you know uh Uh, politics uh, in india at this point of time now coming to now coming to uh, trinomul's you know uh, combat to the bjp's uh, narrative of of double engine is definitely about how you know uh, tmc is reinforcing uh, you know mamta banerjee is reinforcing its image as the as a sole most competent torch bearer of bengal's developmental as well as cultural narratives you know by highlighting the constant neglect uh, you know uh, of the state by the center be it you know gst compensation be it covid 19 you know uh, management funds on fund management funds uh, you know so 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 th this is constantly being highlighted that the center has been perpetually neglecting uh, the state uh, and of course uh, you know touting bjp as you know projecting bjp as as a, as an alien force as an outsider is also you know uh, one of the way uh, you know how tmc is trying to project that the the region's interest cultural you know specificity uh, you know legacy is best protected with the with the with the with the regional party tmc you know who is much more uh, local local in 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 some sense and 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 also much more cognizant of the of the of the demands of the state of the problems of the state of the uh, uniqueness of the state and of course the last part is you know tmc's you know competitive populism you know regarding regarding the the schemes where the tm tmc is claiming you know and has been you know very effectively uh, campaigning on the ground that uh, if if the 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 policies and the governance initiatives the the freebies whatever we, we might choose to call them uh, are much more effective much more better you know uh, a debate between between let's say uh, shastra sathi uh, versus uh, ayushman bharat so if tmc is claiming to give you know give, provide much better version of the central schemes so uh, you know uh, which is which, which is you know which it claims that is is, is you know much more much more benefiting uh, the people than the, the central scheme so this is also a narrative of competitive populism which tmc is trying to you know impose it to to counter bjp's claim of uh, double engine government now how do we make sense of these two you know narratives and 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 where does it clash so so bengal elections of 2021 to my mind is also very important to understand that what is the fate or the trajectory of indian federalism you know uh, that india is going to witness indian democracy is going to witness uh, in the near future on one hand a very, a very different kind of a federal you know dimension that bjp is trying to posit which is which is the the, the you know the narrative of political homogeneity uh, centralizing na narrative that you know that 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 actually marks the the quintessential federal principle of political pl uh, plurality and and diversity uh so 
so what what does it do so it it makes it you know it makes uh, a, a situation it it kind of pushes a situation where you know a, a state government ruled by the bjp can be controlled by the center amenable by the by the central leadership you know which which we have also seen during the during the uh, you know uh, during the congress hegemony during indira gandhi's rule how puppet chief ministers were being used and you know and and and, and the kind of kind of control uh, was being uh, you know you know unleashed uh, from the center so so bjp's narrative of a more homogeneous and a neater principle of federalism you know uh, where uh, there you know there will be uh, you know a kind of unmediated direct narrative so called narrative of development where the regional parties are not there uh, you know as as the elites uh, which which is many you, you know manifested in, in the bjp's uh, the, uh, election slogan uh, you know bikash hobe which which basically you know, you know brings a very different kind of a federal narrative you know which uh, which 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 kind of defies the the quintessential quintessential understanding of of federalism which which is which is you know innately linked to plurality and and diversity uh, you know uh, in 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 many ways so and on the other hand you know uh, it is also to be you know, very closely watched that the kind of federal narrative that tnc is constantly trying to project narrative of you know you know uh, regional specificity who is well equipped to safeguard the idiosyncratic needs of the state you know in the interest of competitive federalism where you know cent centers untrampled you know unparalleled power can be checked uh, you know if if tmc is in in power and it can it can safeguard the people you know state's interest and provide you know governance uh, which is ma again manifested in the in the in the in the tmc slogan that bangla nijer mer kache thak you know this needs to be washed out you know that 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 which 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 kind of uh, you know you know whether we will see uh, on second may uh, you know uh, a kind of federal assertion or a very unique kind of a, of a fed, of you know of a federal narrative uh, uh, you know that that indian democracy will see uh, if if you know bjp makes uh, considerable inroads uh, in the state and i would you know finally end with i think uh, dr sinha's uh, you know uh, reference to the indian express report you know which reflects uh, the the kind of you know uh, the, the kind of nationalizing you know tendency of the of the of the of the of the bengali bengali electorate Uh, which 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 might you know which might you know make us make us think uh, you know uh, how the federal uh, you know you know uh, you know cult you know culture uh, based on you know based on diversity and plurality is going to play out uh, you know in this in this elections that that needs to be watched out very closely and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambar, for a very interesting sort of as you promised your topic promised contentious uh, federalism and. and i think uh, you know we've, we've had this discussion as well uh, before uh, whether we are going to look at the bigger broader picture or the narrative is really within the state uh, talking of ethno nationalism communalism uh, so we've had a variety of speakers variety of takes and i think that is what made this webinar quite uh, enriching i think but it's also made it quite uh, you know long uh, longer than it was hoped for but instead of having two webinars we've try try to i think present quite a lot in this uh, so i'm just going to now keep to um, a few sort of uh, questions that uh, i would like uh, professor um, shekhar bandabadai to address because i think um, one of the questions that um, came up particularly uh, would be of interest to you uh professor bondapadhyay that is from shomojit niyogi uh who says do you think the rise of bjp in bengal along with rising popularity of their culture is main reversion for bengal bengal had always been ahead of caste religion women's empowerment it seems now they will come back uh, to national level um again the whole point of you know the distinctiveness and unique idea of bengal is being played out perhaps with reference to history but we've had a lot of discussion that uh, how that is also changing so he wanted to say anything on that I, briefly i i will very briefly respond because i think that um, that very concept of bengali exceptionalism has been mentioned number of times uh, in this evening's webinar and it has already been uh, responded to very adequately by both shanas uh, shana uh, nawaz uh, and epshita haldar and um, i don't think um 
we are witnessing a reversal. I mean, BJP is coming to a ground, <coughs> to a fertile ground um, for the development of these issues in terms of casteism and Islamophobia. Shanawas has already mentioned um, the Bhadralo culture. I mean, if we go historically, um, the Bhadralo culture essentially um, was very high caste oriented uh, and it was from the very beginning uh, taking a questionable position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, incorporation of the Muslims into the Indian nation. Now, I was stuck by Dr. Haldar's observ last observation about the conversation that um, someone is saying <laughs> that we should have a non-Brahmin uh, chief minister instead of Banerjee Aghosh. I remembered um, the two very famous anthropologists and sociologists, both Ashish Nandi and Andre Bete, had once commented that West Bengal will never have a Dalit chief minister. Um, we can have a Banerjee replaced by Ghos or a Rai, uh, but we'll never have a Dalit chief minister. And this speaks a lot about the inherent casteism and Islamophobia, which had always there in this embedded, deeply embedded in this Hodrilo culture. What I witness personally is the change that BJP has brought in that it has made all these things legitimate. An educated Bhadralok is no longer ashamed to say that I don't like Muslims. Few years ago, they would feel a little bit ashamed to see this, say this openly. So what BJP has done, if there is any shift in culture, I think they have made these attitudes more politically and socially legitimate than it was because of the whole idea of Bengal Renaissance and other things which kind of contested these ideas. But these ideas were always there. I mean, and we, we need to kind of re-examine the whole question of Bengali exceptionalism. So I'll leave it at that. That's great. I think I think these points are again um, uh, are kind of coalescing around, you know, how the social media is facilitated uh, a lot of the openness that you're talking about that you know how easy it is to uh, to, to 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 sort of express your emotions uh, with regard to communalism then just stay within that bubble of political correctness and um so there was a there's an interesting question uh, there about you know why the love jihad campaign didn't pick up in bengal i don't know if Sita, if you want to quickly respond to that before i turn to uh, Indrajit, who's waiting to answer a question that that was uh, there in the previous round. Thank you, Shekhar, uh, Professor Shekharda, for uh, for responding. I think I will also come back to you briefly uh, with another question that is uh, to Shanawas, but I also wanted to hear a little bit from you on that. So, Ipshita, did you want to respond? Did you have yeah, any, a quick uh, yeah, answer sure. yes, on yes. Love Jihad? Because you know you you really work on social media quite a lot. So um, what I want to say is, it's not like that there is no Anis. Uh, compared to the North Indian, if I can use this monolithic term called the North Indian, compared to the North Indian kind of anxiety, and uh, I would say, uh, say uh, you know, what again, intolerance, uh, this kind of, uh, you know, uh, intensity is absent in Bengal, but that doesn't mean that there is less anxiety or there is less intolerance because there are, you know, couples, you know, inter, uh, inter, inter religious with interreligious marriage. They didn't find any place to stay. These are all, you know, known stories among our friends and also in the extended uh, social sphere. But what is very important here is that there is a culture of love marriage without both interreligious and inter caste. But those did not bring any sort of culture, uh, uh, structural change. Like as Ambedkar once said that a kind of instrumental inter-intercast inter marriage won't bring any structural change. Exactly that happened in Bengal. A few, you know, examples of intercaste marriage did not bring any sort of, you know, eradication or any sort of uh, structural critique. So I think the ground is prepared as Professor Bondopad has just mentioned. 
So it's a kind of, and I also mentioned in my, you know, small talk that the actually these intolerance were dormant. They were actually these these were there as the integral, you know, emotion of the uh, upper Savarna Hindu, you know, dominant culture. So if I mean BJP uh, occupies this space, it might trigger those kind of, you know, higher and intense form of intolerance. So that is very annoying. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, I just, I'm just very tempted to mention here that you know I worked as um, a campaign coordinator to, uh, to to remove all caste related adverts from Bengali newspapers, and it is still something that uh, is there. So until that goes, uh, you know, this whole question of uh, intercaste marriage, etc., uh, is going to stay open because you know even till now, all the Bengali newspapers still mention caste in all the marriage columns. So that's that's there and that's not going to go very soon, I think. There are deeper interests to keep that going. Um, and so I just want to um, quickly pick up on uh, Leslie's question that I read out first, but I want to repeat uh, for Indrajit. That is, is communal violence guaranteed should BJP win state and implement CA and NRC in West Bengal? As I understand rightly that the CA can only be implemented should a state agree to it, is that correct? And secondly, how much violence is to go, going on in election campaign? Well, I think the, the, the first part probably you wanted to answer, Indrajit. That's right. Uh, and quite specifically, the question on the CAA and whether it can be implemented if a state does not agree. My understanding is that the short answer to your question is no, the state does not need to agree to the implementation of the CAA. My understanding is that the CAA is a subject of the central government of India. And if the central government has legislated, then states have to follow. State legislatures can pass resolutions against the CAA, as many states have done, but that's a political resolution. So Kerala, Rajasthan, I think Delhi, uh, I don't know what the West Bengal situation is, but these legislative assemblies can pass resolutions indicating that they do not think it's a correct decision. I don't think they can um, uh, neglect or resist in the way that the term is normally understood. What the states can do, which is what Kerala has done, is to take the matter to the Supreme Court under, I think it's Article 131 of the Constitution, if there is a dispute between the center and the state, uh, or center, center and states, then the state can take the matter to the Supreme Court, uh, and which is what Kerala has done. What that does is to buy everyone time. Uh, and as long as the matter is in the Supreme Court, of course, the government cannot insist that the state implement or go ahead with, with, with the legislation. So my, my, my understanding is that uh, the CAA can be implemented irrespective of who's heading the state government. Um, and in, in that respect, I'm not sure that any it's relevant anymore whether the BJP wins the state or doesn't. My understanding is sadly that communal violence is perhaps guaranteed. What, of course, this is not a sort of, um, not to sort of relapse into defeatism to say, oh, it's all the same. Obviously, if a non-BJP government comes to power in West Bengal, you can expect the implementation of the CAA to be delayed. Uh, but I think that's all it will be. It will only be delayed. I don't think they can block it effectively. So thank I you. Yeah. Um, I hope that answers quite well. Um, and and um, I, it kind of ties up with this whole rhetoric of double engine of the government that uh, uh, another question that is uh, to uh, Ambar, if you would like to take from Doipan Choudhury, who is asking, do you think that the rhetoric of double engine government is against the basic constitutional principles because it tries to induce a sense of homogeneity between state and central government, undermining the base, basic ethos of a federal structure? Um, do you want to respond to that very quickly? Uh, yes, sure, did sure. touch upon quite well, but yeah, sure. I like I, I, very very briefly. Uh, of course, uh, definitely, uh, you know, the federal principle, uh, the, you know, instinctively talks about uh, diversity and plurality. You know, in terms of uh, you know uh, our multi-party system. 
definitely you know uh, encapsulates that idea of of federalism uh, the the entire idea of double engine government or or a kind of political homogeneity uh, underlines uh, a kind of centralizing uh, you know tendency uh, you know in terms of in terms of uh, yeah, you know governance at, at at both the levels so definitely in some sense it it it, it very seriously undermines uh, the federal principle uh, which has been one of the most uh, you know you know more, one of the core, print, core core aspects of the of the constitutional architecture uh, of 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 india but uh, i'll 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 you know stop short of calling it um, uh, you know uh, unconstitutional uh, because uh, because you know there is uh, if 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 the electorate elects similar you know uh, parties in, and we have we had that in the in the past as well same party at the center and the state uh so it might not be you know called uh, constitutionally uh, you know in, in, invalid but definitely uh it 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 definitely you know uh, you know uh, spells uh, crisis uh, for the for the uh, you know spirit of federalism thank you thank you thank you ambar that really ties up very well um i have a question for shanawas um but i would ask you to just be very very brief on this because i would ask the same question to um to uh, professor shekhar bondapadhyay as well and that relates to a question from nilanjan banerji about mufassal hindutva he he'd asked this question before and i kind of tried to answer that it does relate the demographics of the question that he did ask before relates directly to rural urban divide um because mufassal hindutva is is not something that is entirely urban and his question was that how is it different to a uh, bhadralok uh, hindutva which i think was one of the reasons that you presented the paper but his question then kind of extended to asking does it change the approach of the bjp to some extent in the campaigns so what has been the strategy for uh, addressing mafasal hindutva and i just wondered whether the same kind of twist we can uh, give to uh, professor shekhar bondapadha whether you know caste does play a role in this kind of strategy so very briefly shanwas uh, on you. that thank you i'll try to be brief so uh, the mafasal hindutva is not necessarily relying upon bjp but rss also so a uh, number of sakhas has been doubled in the last 10 years so it reminds me shubhajit bagchi is reporting of rss sakhas i think two years back in the hindu in who he says he said that the uh, there is a steady growth of rss within uh, 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 within last 10 years actually under the tmc rule so he was quoting someone who was saying that there is right now we have 50000 daily sakhas or like we have 10000 weekly online million meetings we have every year 20 to 25% organizational growth so the mafasal hindutva is actually very much dependent on rss also and why we are saying mafasal hindutva is uh, because the difference of leadership it is offering so uh, till now we have whatever the party is congress tmc or 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 Cong uh, or uh, cpm so uh, unlike all these uh, secular parties the bjp leadership actually right now coming from not necessarily from upper caste english educated urban middle class or uh, for example the uh, small town uh, english educated upper class or uh, upper caste but from a rural leadership they are dalit they are obc they are uh, uh, not sabarna from the uh, uh, category and another thing is uh, bjp he somehow successfully challenged the syncretic culture of bengal what we are witnessing from couple of uh, from last couple of years like for example in my home district malda the Uh, the uh, the the uh, rother mela jalalpur rother mela is very famous you will have lot of rother melas in which the moira is actually muslim or you will have lot of eid in which the guy who is selling tele bhaja he is hindu this time successfully since 2019 lok sabha election bjp successfully campaigned among this uh, common hindu people don't buy your sweet in the rother mela from muslim shop so they successfully organized the anti muslim uh, sentiment among the village population which were very much subscribing the 
syncretic, syncretic value of Bengali culture, which we had in uh, since the pre-colonial time. So that's why I'm saying this leadership is not coming from Jadapur, not from presidency, not from coffee house, not from Nandan film festival. They all are coming from Mofasils. So that's why it's uh, and all the motuaj, all the uh, all the motuaj, all the uh, normal shudros, the Dongol mohal. So this is how the demography is itself very much uh, mofasil kind of uh, the emergence of mofasil politics, which we witnessed in late uh, in the thirties or forties. We are witnessing right now. Thank you. Okay, uh, so I, because you touched on the motuaj, I just wanted uh, Professor Shekhar Bandupada if you had anything specific. To say that you know, yes, Mafasal Hindutva politics will change with the kind of trends that we are seeing with caste. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a it's a long-standing trend. It was from the 1930s that the Hinduization of the Dalit and the Adivasi community started. Hindu Mahasabha started it in a very concerted and organized way in the 1930s. And they were joined by the Vardshevasram Sangha, who, who started the, the institution called Milan Mandir. It, that was specifically to mobilize the Adivasis and the lower caste people around the idea of, Hindu, of a Hindu nation. And at the same time, this um, Hindu mobilization has tried to appropriate um, the local deities and local Hindu customs. And Motua is a, is a very interesting example. I mean, uh, the major question which can be asked that the Motuas are an anti-caste organization. It is against Brahminical domination. It is against uh, Vedic Hinduism, but how come they are accepting the Hindu ideology? But the narrative of Hindu, Hindu ideology is being presented in a very, very different way. And um, this, this symbolic gesture of Modi visiting the Orakandi, which is the most sacred um, kind of uh, pilgrimage center for the Motuas, this is a huge symbolic gesture in the social media. Um, there's always, already a claim that this has given a huge national and international recognition to their identity, to their own movement. And this is where the politics of recognition and politics of identity work. And um, BJP has very carefully introduced that into, into this. And if you look, um, Badri Narayan has just a, a recent book out on the Republic of Hindutva, where he argues that this is not typical in West Bengal, but in other parts of India also, BJP has been trying to, uh, to kind of appropriate local deities and local religious traditions to expand its net and slightly change the narrative. And I have also seen that, I mean, the, uh, Shana was mentioned the RSS mobilization, the RSS shakhas were being established right after the independence, right up the, after the partition. And they were kind of changing the narrative very carefully. Um, they were telling these people to that most important thing is to remember the partition and the violence and the very important fact that they had to leave their homeland and come to a foreign uh, to a different part where they were they have not been treated very well. So the partition narrative has been kind of emphasized to displace the anti-caste narrative and that is where that is how the the these groups have been gradually attracted to a more articulate hindu identity or hinduized identity that that kind of thing and also in a you know what my finding is that on a day-to-day -day basis not all motuas kind of make a very struct, em emphasize a structural disjuncture between Matua and the Hindu identity. They, they also participate in the popular uh, Hindu uh, festivals like Durga Puja and Kali Puja, et cetera, et cetera. So there is all, there has, has always been um, an ambiguous space and, and it is there the new narrative or what if you call it Mafasil uh, Hindutva or whatever, it is in, 
into that space that this new narrative is being scripted. Thank you. Um, I think there are a few more questions that uh, goes back to this whole Supreme Court wording cases. And I think um, there's, there's a question from Leslie on still on the Supreme Court likely to rule that CAA is contrary to secular constitution of India or that Kerala's challenge will be struck down. Um, and there's also on the wo wording of case being taken to Supreme Court, does it involve questioning of both validity of CAA and NRC and on what basis? If there's anyone from the panel that would uh, you know, like to uh, sort of quickly respond to these two. And then I have one final question for myself uh, to Moitish and then we will just wrap that up. Uh, is there anyone who'd like to take this? Because I think we have discussed this quite uh, a lot already. I can, I can quickly sort of just, okay. obviously yeah. I don't want to comment on the Honorable Supreme Court's, uh, you know, what it's which way it's likely sure. to go, but um, it's anyone's guess whether the Supreme Court is likely to go against the uh, central government um, or whether Kerala's challenge will eventually be struck down. Uh, I think most people would go with the latter that eventually the Kerala uh, challenge will be struck down. Um, I don't have access to the exact wording, but a report from the Hindustan Times, which reported the petition going, you know, uh, uh, Kerala's peti petition, um, says, and I quote, the petition state, that is the Kerala government's petition states that the CAA violates the right to equality under Article 14 of the Constitution of India, right to life under Article 21, and freedom to practice religion under Article 25. So I think the petition is against the CAA rather than the NRC. Again, I'm quoting this from Hindustan Times, uh, not from the original uh, judgment. Uh, sorry, the original petition. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm really going to have to wrap up this session because it's it's already quite long. And I just have, uh, because Moitish, you've been really waiting uh, for your turn, but I don't think there was any direct question at you. Uh, except that something came to my mind about... Sorry, I was just out of respect for the other panelists and sitting through. I, I don't, I, I am not uh, particularly uh, waiting for it to say something, I've, you know, unless... No, 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 I, I, I wanted to bring out a question actually that was raised, but it wasn't directed to you, but it could have some relevance to what you had said already. So the question, uh, I think it was earlier in the chat is that, you know, about a comment from Pujokanto Mishro uh, regarding uh, the possibility of a post-poll alliance. Um, that was the question that was raised and uh, very much earlier in the chat. And that kind of ties up slightly with my uh, point on this whole uh, unpredictability of a triangular contest that, that you had raised in your, uh, in your presentation that, um, that you know the triangular contest makes it difficult uh, to to predict anything, and so the, this whole point about a post-poll alliance, you know, what is it that is going to drive? I mean, is there a possibility, or 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 is or something like this, some kind of a question like this, can crop up because of the total uncertainty that we are facing? I mean, is there anything that we can tie up? Yeah, just very quickly, if you have to sure. say. Sure. So, um, you know. Um, Two quick points. So yesterday I was giving an academic seminar on something else. And this was uh, the Harvard MIT Joint Development Seminar. And a political economy person who happens to be working on France and works on voting behavior, he suddenly mentioned he has written uh, read my recent piece in The Wire on the West Bengal election. And, uh, and I was a bit surprised because this was, a, you know, it was a more a specific thing. So I was surprised. And he said, it reminds him of the situation in France, that there is anti-incumbency, people are unhappy with Macron. And then they're worried that they don't feel that the left alliance, the socialists actually might win. And then they feel that they could be splitting the, you know, vote in a way that that could you know, benefit. So therefore, it's as, as somebody who's, who sort of works on uh, sort of underlying political economy forces at work, that's kind of in a way reassuring that there are certain patterns here that, uh, that are kind of somewhat objective. Having said that, I would say, see, this is the classic situation. 
if you have at this stage, what will you say that, yes, I'll ally with whoever and then we'll take a call on who we want to keep out? You don't want to say that. It's, you know, it's the classic, it's think of a you know, cricket or football tournament. You're not going to say that, okay, if there's a tie and then I want that team to lose so that then I'm going to play with that. You're never going to say that. He's always going to say that I'm going to win this match. That's what I'm going to do. So therefore, I mean, I think it's perfectly fine for uh, Mr. Mishra and I, I'm sure if I were in his position, uh, I would say the same thing, that we are here to win the battle. But come on, you know, after the election results are out and you have a certain number of seats to the Bamjot, certain to the Trinomul and certain to the, you know, and BJP and no party is in a position to form a government, you know, the hands will be forced, right? I mean, so therefore at that point, you, you won't be able to either outside support or, you know, which is likely. And at that point, it would even have some legitimacy, whatever way, you, you know, uh, whichever way it's going to play out. So therefore, I think, again, I, I think this is all in a way on script. Essentially, I would expect every political leader to kind of say that we are, we are going to win it. Uh, mm -hmm. Opinion polls are not looking promising, but opinion polls have been wrong too. So we, we don't know. But that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Um, so um, just one very final comment, and it's, it's something that has been brewing inside me throughout this session that is brought out by many of you. Uh, you know, I, I leave it open to either Ambar or Indrajit to comment on, because it's, it kind of is, is this bigger question, you know, Bengal will become greater Bangladesh. And I just wonder, is that going to be a good thing, given Bangladesh's current achievement in the human development index and that we are all kind of planning for sustainable development goals, which is another big thing that uh, puts us right in front of this contentious federalism that we've been talking about and takes us away from the traditional sort of quarrel of communalism and all that, which is what is the traditional campaign. But we, we brought the bigger picture out and in that bigger picture, I just wonder, whether a narrative like this, Bengal will become Bangladesh. Does it stand a chance? Um, so Indrajit, just a, just, just a very quick snap comment from you and then we shall end this session. I, I'm, I'm definitely certainly not going to answer <laughs> that in the way that you would like, but, but I do want to uh, remind everyone and we have historians here, of course, uh, who will testify to this. But remember that the demand for Pakistan started out in Dhaka. And we know where that went. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I don't think there will be a greater Bangladesh sort of thing. But uh, you know, if, if people push majoritarian agendas too much, national unity is a very fragile thing. Uh, it's built over decades of uh, hard political negotiations. And nobody on any side should take anything for granted. Uh, and the, the greatest example is in our own neighborhood. That's all I'd like to say. Sorry, I'm not taking the bait. <laughs> yeah, um, I wasn't. I wasn't expecting anything more. So, Amber, uh, another snap comment from you before you finish. No, I, I completely uh, second. Uh, uh, you know, Doctor uh, Roy's uh, uh, you know uh, observation. And I'll simply you know add that you know plurality and diversity is something which is uh, inalienable uh, and indispensable kind of a principle for a kind of a complicated uh, you know diverse terrain like India. Uh, so definitely, uh, you know, a kind of a competitive, uh, you know, federalism where, you know, you know, a kind of a constant check uh, on the, uh, on the, on the, on the, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, constant, co constant uh, uh, supremacy of the center. Uh, you know, we have a structurally, uh, you know, centralized kind of federalism. So center is anyway, very, very, very strong structure. So now that we have a very, very aggressive kind of a, you know, ruling, you know, ruling hegemonic uh, political force at the national level. So definitely where, where national oppositional space is shrinking rapidly, you know, these kind of federal, uh, you know, pockets of regional opposition, you know, what I call occasional spasms of resistance uh, is, is definitely the, the only probably uh, the saving grace uh, for uh, a kind of kind of diversity that, that India presents. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you again. I can see Suvira is back. Is, is Suvira, you're still there. If you wanted to add anything on a final note uh, from SOAS, are you still there? Um, he's probably not here, but uh, I can still see him on the panel. Um, and, and of course, Salim has left. And so I just want to thank the entire panel 
for uh, this wonderful session that we've had. And you can see from the, the rich uh, speakers list that you know I tried to, to bring out all different angles from here, the larger picture, the smaller picture, but also uh, to establish some kind of dialogue between uh, the traditional narrative of Bengal elections and uh, the, the differences that uh, uh, we've been talking about that, uh, that are emerging politics, that's also political uh, in, a, in a much more kind of bigger Indo-Pacific sense or tying up with Bangladesh or within the South Asian context. And the whole idea of uh, the Sanglap Forum, which I want to conclude with, is that uh, you know, it is inspired by uh, Shukumar Ray's Monday Club, which is a bit more free flowing, uh, critical uh, analysis of things to break many stereotypes and to encourage that kind of critical thinking. That is the whole point of Sai Sang Lap that uh, we have had previous sessions on. And uh, you know, usually these conversations spill over to drinks and meetings and teas and coffees. <laughs> it, has a, it has a much more extended life than is possible in this digital <laughs> forum. But um, as I would say that you know, the Monday Club is about fuzzy meanings and to deconstruct these fuzzy uh, stories that we've had, uh, many of which uh, are about learning things alternatively through expressions and language. So language plays quite an important role in uh, Sangla Forum. So we always have artists, writers, uh, and uh, others, other languages expressed and something that we briefly touched on uh, through vernacular social media. And Ipsita has also talked about, uh, you know, taking things to the Mafassal and learning things from the Mafassal agencies. And of course, the role of the social media, which is a big thing to touch on, but we don't have the time. So I want to thank again, and I want to end the session. So uh, a very good evening to everybody uh, as well. And thank I you, hope you see, very much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.